Dr. Yes. Raymond, I want to move next to the uh, role of the Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood. Thank you. And then to explore with you the decision making as regards the introduction of hepatitis C screening. <coughs> Excuse me. Do, now, do you know why there was no National Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood prior to 1989? I know you weren't there prior to 1989. Did you glean any reasoning when you joined the department? No, I think when I came, I was basically told, this is a committee that's been set up. You're going to be the medical secretary. And literally, well, a month and three days or four days after I started, it happened. So I was basically told, it's there. This is what its function is. And you're going to have to do this, that, and the other for it. Um, and in terms of its functioning, um, uh, or its, its terms of reference, if we could have, please, Paul, PRSC 0001189. Um, this is an, uh, a paper for the first ACVSB meeting, and we can see the terms of reference uh, set out at the top of the page to advise the health departments of the UK on measures to ensure the virological safety of blood whilst maintaining adequate supplies of appropriate quality for both immediate use and for plasma processing. Um, and then there's a reference there to the remit being UK-wide. Sorry, can we zoom in again on that top half of the page, Paul? Concern is matters of major policy, not the detailed implementation of policy. Um, was it, as far as you understood it, part of the role of the ACVSB to consider questions of financial resources, how things might or might not be paid for? It was not a major concern. I think the thing is, finances, everything in the NHS has costs, and so finances are going to be considered in anything to do with the NHS. Um, and. I think the, my understanding of the role of the advisory committee was that it was a group of independent experts, that means people not tied to the department, who were there to provide advice to ministers, and ministers could either accept that advice or could reject it. There was no obligation on ministers to accept the advice. I think in reality they accepted it every time on the basis that these are experts and if they're experts who don't have any particular um, reason for um, pushing a particular view, such as commercial reasons or whatever. Although having said that, I'm not sure whether the committee ever did ask people about commercial interests but I think people assumed that they didn't have any specific commercial interests. And basically, the committee was there, the great and the good. The chair was, of course, from within the department. It was the deputy chief medical officer, first Dr. Harris, right, and then Dr. Dr. Harris and Dr. Mattis. Yes. Um, there would then be observers from the department, observers from the Scottish Home and Health Department, Welsh Office, and the Northern Irish Department of Health. Yes. Um, and, and then the secretariat. Yes. Um, one of the observations that has been made by another witness to the inquiry in terms of the membership of the uh, advisory committee um, was that it may have had insufficient public health expertise and too much focus on virology. Uh, do you recall whether that was something that was ever considered or discussed, as whether the, the membership should be broadened? I don't, I can never, rec well, I can't recall, and, and from the papers I can't see any evidence at any of the meetings that somebody has said that they feel that the membership of the advisory committee is either insufficient or inappropriate. And I think um, the committee was set up before I was there. I had no hand in deciding who was going to be on it. Um, if one looks at the membership, well, some of the people on it were obvious, i.e. the um, Harold Gunson as head of the transfusion service in England and Wales, and also a representative of the Scottish Blood Transfusion Service, it was Rufa Mitchell initially. And obviously the fractionators, um, Richard Lane 
in England and um, Robert Perry for Scotland. So they were the obvious people. Now, obviously, it's a virological safety, so therefore you must have virologists on it. You can't operate without virologists. The other people, well, I think there was a, there was a general hematologist, and I think at some stage I was asked to nominate some. I think I maybe not asked twice to nominate somebody. The first person I nominated was Dr. Geoffrey Summerfield from Middlesbrough, but I think his work was such that he found it difficult to come to the committee because obviously it's quite a journey from Middlesbrough and I, I don't know the railway connections, but it may have been just that the connections were very difficult for him. But he actually had to absent himself from a number of meetings and in the end he resigned because he realised that he wasn't able to contribute. And then we had a replacement for him. And again, I think I was asked about that. But apart from those two nominations, I don't think I was ever asked about nominations. Um, we see from minutes, uh, um, a, a refrain from the minutes from time to time is a reminder about the confidentiality of yes. the, the meetings. And again, we've heard from Dr. Perry, who said that that was something that was very um, uh, rigorously emphasized, in particular by Dr. Metters uh, to, to members. Um, do, do you um, recall uh, from the time why it was thought that confidentiality was so critical? I think um, I, I've re I'm referred to this in my statement. I think there are several reasons for the confidentiality. One reason was that the committee would make recommendations, and those recommendations would go to the department, to ministers. And if ministers were to choose not to accept those recommendations or were to come back and say, look, we've seen your recommendation, but could you change this or change that or whatever, that sort of information probably should not be in the public domain because, after all, it's probably something that will be covered by PII in other circumstances. Um, and the idea of a blow-by-blow -blow account in the press of what goes on in the committee, I don't think was in anybody's, in, was not in the interests either of the department or basically anybody that was going to be affected by any of the recommendations of the ACVSB. So I think that was one um, reason. Another reason is that, as we all know, different medics, different scientists have different views. And if a particular scientist or medic who was on the committee gave his view, he felt that that view was for the information of the committee that needed it. He didn't want to have to go and defend that view against people who might disagree with him or her. So I think there was that point. The other point, which also obviously flows through all of this, is commercial confidentiality. If the committee were talking, I mean, say we talked about s screening kits. Now, initially for, a for Hep C, there was just one, then there was a second one, and then later on there were more and more and more and more. And if the committee were to come up and say, we think um, the screening kit from such and such a company is the best, again, would that be against commercial interests? Would that be, um, would a com could a company say that they had not had a fair hearing? In which case we then end up with all the stuff being discussed at the ACVSB, all the subsidiary papers, who said what to whom, and who had influence, you know, it could be a... Would you accept commercial confidentiality as a consideration could be addressed by redaction of appropriate parts of the minutes? Not a reason to prevent the broader public health debate from being made, uh, made public. But you see, the question with redaction is, as you know, is what you redact. Because I have seen papers where bits have been redacted where 
never in a month of Sundays could I justify that redaction because it is just so completely unnecessary. And other times you look at it and you say, well, actually, perhaps that particular pic could have been redacted. So I think the concept of redaction, while it's fine in theory, it's the practicalities that are the problem. It might be said that a consequence of confidentiality was that it insulated both the committee and the department from criticism. Was that part of the thinking at the time, as far as you can recall? I don't think so, because I think you have to look at the confidentiality. I do not believe that every single thing that was said at ACVSB was confidential to the committee. And we've got um, minutes of, from Scotland, for example, where it was quite obvious that Ruth and Mitchell had discussed things that had been discussed at the ACVSB with Professor John Cash, for example. So therefore, confidentiality had been breached in a sense. But I think with confidentiality, I don't think anybody in the department or Dr. Metis for his part would have said to people, no, you cannot say anything about what we've said to anybody. Because after all, one of the points of the committee was to try and get as much information as we could. Now, obviously, a lot of the information was from scientific articles, etc. But if, for example, one of the members of the committee heard something or said something, well, there's nothing to stop him, you know, on an informal basis, going back to his place of work and saying to an a colleague, particularly somebody who might even know more than that individual about something, and say, well, look, we were chatting about this. What do you think? And, you know, again, a breach of confidentiality in the strictest sense, but not one that anybody would lose sleep over. In terms of the mechanics for the arrangements of the meetings, um, part of your role, um, and I think the role of the Administrative Secretary, Mr. Canavan, as well, was to gather the relevant materials, circulate them, and so on. Is it the case that you also had a, or usually had a pre-meeting meeting with the chair? Yes, usually we'd have a pre-meeting meeting, and I think it was, um, well, I can't remember with the, Dr. Harris, but definitely with Dr. Metters. I think he was aware that with all of these committees, you have a fixed period of time that the committee can run on. And it, you can't just drag it on and on for hours on end. And from my other committee work, I can well see the reason for that. Because if a committee just drags on, people will walk out because they've got other things to do, um, or topics get rushed to try and fit it in. So I think Dr. Metters wanted really to have a good idea as to what is likely to happen during the committee. And I think if you look through some of the um, papers that I produced, the covering papers, you will see there that the committee's actually asked questions. You know, what does the committee think about this? In a sense, focusing the mind of the committee. So, and because these papers were sent out to the committee members two weeks in advance, most of them, I hopefully most of them, would have read the papers, would have read my covering notes, and would have seen from that, look, what the committee needs to decide is this or that. Um, and for the purposes of the pre-meeting meeting, that, or the briefing meeting that, that you, you um, and uh, Mr. Canavan, and I think um, also during her time there, Dr. Pickles, would have with the chair, there would be a written briefing produced for the chair? I th well, looking through the papers, it looks as though there was usually a written thing. I, whether it was every single time, I suspect it would depend upon how busy people were, because obviously with the HIV haemophilia litigation, it might well be on a given occasion that it was not possible to, pre to, present, to prepare a written briefing, and it might be that we met up with Dr. Metters or whoever, and talked it through, but coming with our own notes. And, and I, can I just ask you to look at one example? It's DHSC 00035830043. Um, uh, is there another page to that? 
there a second page? Yeah, great. So, yes, the first page just gives us the date. It's for the, the meeting, but we can see from the top of this, it's for the ACVSB meeting on the 22nd of May 1989. This is the chairman's brief. Uh, I think this is your handwriting on it. Yes. Um, uh, and then if we go up to the second page, we can see the heading non A, non B at the bottom of the page. Paragraph 14, the suggestion there it, to the chair is that a number of individuals, including yourself, should be asked to speak to their respective papers. Um, and then, um, would it be right to understand Dr. Metters is being given a steer um, following the general discussion, you will wish to focus the committee's attention on the recommendations in paragraph five of ACBSB 2 of 7, which is one of the particular papers. You may wish to point out that while CBLA has, top of the next page, legitimate concerns about marketing its products, the committee should consider the issues only in relation to protecting public health. The question is whether the committee agrees there is no pressing need to introduce routine surrogate testing for non-A, non-B hepatitis for health reasons, but that the position should be reconsidered when the results of the BTS study are available. Now, um, first of all, would, would, would this briefing be put together by, by you or by Mr. Canavan, or, or was it a joint effort? I think it would be a joint effort, but I think Doc, Mr. Canavan would be in the lead, so to speak. So, for example, I mean, so if you go back to the top of it, it talks about arrangements for lunch, etc., which obviously is not something that I'd be involved in. But if there were medical bits in it, then I would contribute, but ultimately it is an administrative function. It could be said that the way in which this is described is really giving Dr. Metters a steer as to the steer that should then be given to the committee in, in pursuit of an outcome that there's no pressing need to introduce routine surrogate testing. Well, I think this, I think the way it operated was, you see, we were in contact with Dr. Metters, well, with Dr. Harris, I didn't really have very much contact, but I, I really would probably focus on with Dr. Metters. We had a lot of contact with him. I mean, it's not as though I was in his office every day, but if you look at the minutes that are amongst the papers, you know, there are a lot of minutes that I write which are either to Dr. Metz or copied to him. And how often I'd be, I wouldn't be that often in his office. I don't know even how often we had telephone conversations, but you know, but we were in quite constant contact. So for example, in this particular instance, the chances are that the topic had already been discussed earlier, and here we are reminding the chairman that this is something we discussed before. And this is, in, a res in some respects, this is a reminder to the chairman of what we've discussed, so that, I don't know, <laughs> I cannot remember exactly, but I assume that the chairman would have taken this with his own annotations to the meeting. And then when he's going through the particular sections of the meeting, he'd look it up and say, oh, this is something I need to ask them. I think that's the way it operated. Just on the question of what Dr. Metis might have done in his own papers, we'll come to the question yeah. of, of, of what happened to some files um, in the course mm. of the afternoon. But is, it, is this your understanding um, that Dr. Metis' papers, personal papers, were disposed of um, and so that those were not available? to the department. I do, uh, that, I, that I have found out from this. I didn't know that before. Um, you've told us, so we can take that down, you've told us, uh, I think you've, you've said in your response to the Penrose Inquiry warning letter, you've made the point that on, on the Secretariat you didn't have a vote. Um, was the ACVSB a voting committee? It doesn't appear from the minutes and and isn't, I think, the effect of the evidence the inquiry has received so far? No, I don't, I cannot recall occasions when the chairman actually asked for a vote, because obviously if you had a vote, then you'd have to have all this argument about does the chairman have a, <laughs> over, you know, if it's a, if it's a split vote, does the chairman have a vote? So I don't think there was ever any suggestion of a vote in that sense. But I think what I mean by not having a vote, I mean not having a say in how the committee, because 
usually you will see that the chairman sums up. And usually the chairman summing up, he would actually, I'm trying, well, you see, obviously this is a long time ago and I may confuse this with other committees, but my understanding, my recollection for the best that it is, is that Dr. Metters would actually go round the table. And I think he was quite keen that people said something. And so, for example, if we were discussing a particular topic, and if somebody had said nothing at all about that topic, he might quite easily say to, some, to somebody, Dr. So-and-so, have you a view, or do you agree, or whatever. So I think when he sums up, it's the summation of the general mood of that committee meeting. And there hasn't been a vote, because in a sense, usually the majority of people would agree a particular line. There was, I can't recall occasions when people had stood up and said, I completely disagree with this. I think this is absolute rubbish. I think we should do something else. I think most of, I mean, see, this was a committee, people were polite to each other. And people, I think, accepted that others might have a different view if they had a particular view, I think, well, there were one or two people probably that didn't, didn't possibly push their view as hard as they might. There were other people that were much more pushy with putting forward their view, but that's all, any committee, that's the case. But I think overall there wasn't any need for a vote because it was obvious which way people were thinking. Can I ask you to look at an extract from the evidence of Dr. Perry to the inquiry? Yes. It's INQY 1000184, please, Paul, page 34. I'm sorry, page 35, in fact. Um, if we pick it up in the bottom half of the page, um, left hand side, uh, line four. So this is picking up. Dr. Perry's evidence to the Penrose inquiry um, in, in which uh, he was asked about the contribution of the secretariat to the meetings and whether they contributed to meetings. And then his answer to the Penrose inquiry, uh, Dr. Perry says, yes, there were certainly Dr. Raymond and Dr. Pickles. I'm trying to recall if there were others. And then paragraph, sorry, line 14, yes, periodically they were called upon specifically to report on a particular issue, but also took a full part in the discussions of the committee. And then the question that's put to him, line 17 to 20, was um, that the Secretariat weren't simply there to put together the agenda and take a note. They participated actively in the discussions. Dr. Perry's answer, they had quite se senior medical officers from the DH that were part of the committee. They weren't full members, but then it wasn't a voting committee. It didn't used to vote on issues and so on. There was a process that I never really understood what the detail was, and we would have the discussions at the meeting, and then those discussions would get taken away to the Department of Health for further consideration, and perhaps a revised position might come back from the Department of Health for consideration. So they were very much an integral part of the process as far as I can recall. And then he draws a distinction between that and um, uh, the role of the observers from Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, more observers than participants. Um, do you uh, accept his description of the process as an accurate one? No. In what sense do you say that it's inaccurate? Right, okay, shall we start off with um, full part in the discussions of the committee? No. Taking a full part in the discussions of the committee means that I would have been asked, Dr. Raymond, what is your view about this? That never, ever happened. Never. I was there purely and simply as a facilitator. I was there, as is mentioned, I can't remember which report is in the BSE inquiry report, where they talk about the function of a secretariat. And we were very much aware of what our role was. Our role was to make sure that the committee worked. It functioned. And our role was to get together the papers that we thought were going to be helpful to the committee to make their judgments. It was not to make any decision or to influence the decision in any shape or form. If we leave aside the phrase full part in the discussions of the committee, 
Did you uh, participate actively in the discussions? No. If you look in the minutes of the committees, and as I think I made the comment in my, I can't remember this in my first statement or wherever, if you look at some of the minutes of the committee, you will see that my name only appears in the whole of the committee minutes as being a member of the Secretariat, and my name does not appear anywhere else in those minutes. And if you look carefully at the minutes, you will see that I present a paper, I'm asked to update people on what has happened. I take no part in the discussion. Who prepared the minutes? The minutes were prepared primarily by the HEO, not Mr. Canvan, but his deputy, who was there at the um, committee. I would be shown the draft committee minutes because I tended to make my own personal notes of what had been discussed at the committee. So therefore, I would look at my notes and see whether they agreed with what, well, David Burridge was the one that obviously um, I'm most aware of, what he had written. And then if there were any suggestions that I could um, make, apart from typos, obviously, then I would make those suggestions. And then the minutes were then um, circulated to the committee members and usually at the subsequent um, um, committee people were asked are there any errors and occasionally there were errors that were picked up. Now the first meeting of the committee was on the 4th of April 1989. I'm not going to go to those minutes no. for the transcript um, they are at NHBT five zeros four one underscore zero zero three for present purposes i think it's sufficient to say it was said in the course of that meeting that hepatitis would be on the agenda for the next meeting yes. is that right um, if we then go to the second meeting it's n actually now i'm going to check the reference nhbt five zeros four one underscore zero two zero i think Um, just so that we can get a sense of who, who is in attendance, I'm not going to do this for every set of minutes, but we've got the chair who at that point was still Dr. Harris, so before Dr. Metis took over. We've got the various members. We've got you and Mr. Canavan um, present from the Secretariat. In terms of the observers, we know obviously who Dr. Pickles was. We, you told us previously about Dr. Rockblatt. What was Dr. Perv's role? Sorry. Well, Dr. Rockblatt was the SMO, I think I mentioned, in charge of, well, I don't know what her other roles were, but she was the one that was in charge of blood products at MCA. Yeah. And Dr. Purvis was the pharmacist um, in MCA who, again, had responsibility for blood products. Um, and then the other three, Dr. McIntyre, Dr. Flett, and Dr. George, are representatives from Scotland, Wales, and Northern and Ireland. Northern Ireland, um, yes. Um, uh, and then I don't think we see any reference to there being someone else there from Mr. Canavan's team taking notes. But so presumably on that occasion, Mr. Canavan would have taken notes. Um, it, can we then go to page three, just so that we can pick up the chronology of decision-making in relation to hepatitis? Um, we've got there non A, non B, um, just above paragraph 16. Zoom in on 16 to 21, could we pull? Thank you. Um, uh, and then um, there's a reference in paragraph 17 to the, the, the Chiron test. Uh, there's a reference in paragraph 18 to a questionnaire. Sorry, um, I think in that paragraph 16 there, presumably he says that anti-HBC instead of anti-HBS. That's picked up in a, yes, it's picked up in a, in a later set of minutes. Um, uh, there's a reference in paragraph 19 to the position of ALT testing in the context of fractionation and, and products. And then in terms of um, um, uh, testing of, in relation to non-A, non-B, agreed non-A, non-B testing should not be introduced into the NVTS prior to the results of the UK non-A, non-B trial. Anti-HBC testing was not without problems. The chairman considered that PHLS may need to be involved in the follow-up. Is that a reference to... Uh, surrogate testing there, as you understand it? That's surrogate testing, yes. 
Um, and then paragraph 21, the department would keep the issue of testing under review. The use of Clarin or surrogate testing would be influenced by Clarin data once released. MRC might be asked to consider members regarded the matter to be a priority. So a statement of it being a priority, but essentially no decision being taken at this stage. No. Um, it's just something that will be kept under review. Yes, but having said that, I mean, so I don't know whether you refer there to my, because I prepared a paper, what is it, ACVSB 2.7, which was a background to hepatitis and non-A, non-B. Yes, I'm not proposing to go to that. I'm, um, just no, no, but there isn't time to go to all the papers. For yes. formality. Um, there is, though, if we go to DHSC 0002494 underscore 048, a summary of action points. So you'll see it says Advisory Committee on the Biological Safety of Blood meeting of the 22nd of May 89. So that's the meeting we've just been looked at. Summary of action arising. And then there's a number of matters set out. If we go over the page... Um, we can see it continues. Before I look, ask you about any of the details, do you know who produced this document? Was this you or Mr. Canavan, or again, was it a joint effort? I think this would have been Mr. Canavan or his uh, deputy. Okay. And then um, if we go to, on this page, um, paragraph 13... I just wonder whether you can help us understand this. Consider separate requirements for ALT testing pure science or public health. Now, th that's not something that one can make sense of, or I haven't been able to make sense of, looking at the minutes. Are you able to assist us in understanding what that, what that question is intended to reflect? I honestly can't tell you, because um, basically the, dis the discussion about ALT testing, particularly when it came to BPL, was that they were interested in having ALT testing because it would mean that their products could be sold to those countries that required ALT testing. So <laughs> the public health aspect, well, we discussed this later on in subsequent committee meetings. Um, so I, I, I cannot actually explain that because um, the pure science of ALT is well, I mean, say, the relevance of ALT is public health, in theory, or commerce. I don't know where the pure science comes into it. If we look then at paragraph 14, consider reminding clinicians of need for post-transfusion hepatitis reporting. Um, again, it's not, I think, completely clear how that emerges from the minutes, but I don't, don't think that particularly matters. Whose job would it have been to action these action points? I think, ultimately, the administrator, if... They wanted me to write to somebody like the Royal College of Pathologists or College of Physicians or whatever to ask them to remind their members about this. But um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, so I don't know where that came from, presumably. See, I don't know whether this is a sort of a wish list as much as things that actually we need to do, or this is something we need to bear in mind for the future? I don't know. Um, was this routinely done, a summary of action points, as far as you can recall? I was surprised about this, because I cannot recall these sort of things happening regularly. OK, if we, if we move on then, in any event, to the third meeting of the ACVSB, 3rd of July, 89... NHBT 5072 underscore 025. Um, and if we pick it up at paragraph 3, you'll, that, that answers the point about the, um, the, the typographical error in the records in the minutes. If we go over the page to page 2... Um, bottom of the page, uh, paragraph 10, so there's reference to, to, to some of the, two of the, the ACVSB papers, which we have in the material that was provided to you, um, Dr. Uh, Raymond. 
Um, Council of Europe paper stated that anti-HBC testing alone was not sufficient to eradicate post-transfusion hepatitis, and members supported this view. Again, I don't know whether you can assist in relation to this, but um, do you know why the, the, the question apparently posed and answered was relating to eradication rather than reduction of post-transfusion hepatitis, which might be a more relevant question to ask and answer? Well, I think everybody hoped that we'd find something that would completely clear post-transfusion hepatitis, which obviously was something that had, um, people were aware of for a number of years, and ideally you would eradicate it. That was the ideal. Um, and Council of Europe papers, um, obviously you have to remember that the people on the Council of Europe were you know, a very large number of countries, and sometimes their English might not be ideal. They may not um, be aware of the nuances of, an, of the words that were used. So it may be that what they really meant was reduction rather than eradication. I do not know. But in an ideal world, it would have been eradication. Um, then if we um, go to the... So, well, actually, if we carry on... So can we have that document back on screen, please, Paul? we we'll just go to the next two paragraphs. Um, paragraph 11, bottom of the page. Again, is it right to understand that's looking at the issue of surrogate testing? Yes. Um, and there is no decision in, in particular. that It just says it not, doesn't reveal anything of specificity. Um, and a reference to commercial stance of test manufacturers. So certainly no, no, dis, no decision to recommend any no. form of surrogate testing. Is that right? Is that, is that, is that a correct reading of the, the minutes? Yes, although I must say that looking at that, I'm surprised about the figure of 25%. I would have thought it would have been lower, but maybe that was what it was. And then we see in relation to um, uh, HCV screening, yes. uh, reference in paragraph 12 to the, to the Chiron test, uh, in first-time recipients of factor eight, and a suggestion of study of stored haemophiliac sera. And then top of the next page. Although that is interesting, that comment about the haemophiliacs having had their first treatment, that shows problems with sensitivity because obviously they should have been positive. Um, and then if we go to the top of the next page, we see uh, Dr. Mortimer reporting that um, he, from a conference, considered the findings represented a persuasive case that the Chiron test results were reliable. Um, and then the suggestion is then further information will be gathered for consideration at the next meeting. Yes, I mean, so I made a comment about this. Unfortunately, minutes are a summary of what was said and what was done at a committee. It doesn't tell you what other people said, but presumably the fact that the chairman said we need to get a lot more data suggests that the committee as a whole were not persuaded that this test was the answer to everything. And um, this was very early on, this in the, at the time of the first tests using Chiron. Um. If we go to, please, um, NHBT 5061 underscore 035. We can see that that meeting was the 3rd of July 1989. This is a minute from you a month later, 3rd of August 1989. Yes. Um, Dr. Jones, Med ISD, um, what division was that? He was... I'm not. If you don't, I, know. I get a bit confused because you see, I was at one stage in Med ISD, and Dr. Jones. If you look later on, there was a um, thing about that meeting in Rome and everything, and he was my he was the SPMO, who was Dr. Pickle Senior. So I'm not sure whether this was at a time when they were changing names for branches and divisions. So I presumably Med ISD. You know, that is my guess, is that he was Dr. Pickle's line manager and the SPMO, because 
Med ISD at one stage did include blood. So I, so I can't really answer that. Don't worry. Um, we can see that um, a trigger for this minute is a conversation with Dr. McIntyre. Yes. Now, Dr. McIntyre was the SHHD representative. He'd been at the meeting of the 3rd of July. Yes. Um, it, it appears uh, um, th that there might have been some uncertainty in, t in his mind as to what the, the position was. But, but be that as it may, you say in paragraph four, I confirm Dr. McIntyre's impression that the ACVSB had decided that at present non-A, non-B was not to be screened for as a routine. Um, the, um, if we then just go to the paragraph two, you, it would appear that Dr. McIntyre wanted to know whether it was correct that decisions <coughs> on screening for non-A, non-B were to be a national decision. Um, what was your understanding at the time, if any, of why it seemed to be thought that a decision had to be taken nationally? Well, I think throughout the period um, when we were considering hepatitis C screening, it was agreed that um, a decision about testing should be taken across all four nations. And otherwise, there would be difficulties in explaining to patients and to doctors as to what, why a decision had been taken. And it was, we were after all, the UK after all was one country in, a, in general terms. And so decisions made in one part of that nation, the, well, I keep on getting confused between nation and country and everything, but decisions in one part of the UK might well impact on another part. I mean, say, a classic example of that is North Wales, who were supplied by blood from Liverpool, even though they were over the border, because the, the transfusion centre for Wales was in South Wales, in Swansea, and that supplied southern Wales but not Northern Wales, because Northern Wales obviously was much closer and more convenient transport-wise to Liverpool. So, you know, what would happen if England made a decision and Wales had a different decision? You know, you'd then even be splitting Wales into two halves. If we just go to the top of the next page, I want to ask you about paragraph eight. I mentioned to Dr. Gunson that I had heard via PD that PHLS, Dr. Mortimer, was seen to publish results of their experience of chiron testing of presumed non-A, non-B samples. PD had been given to understand that PHLS would be, would be making a recommendation for use of this test in this publication. Dr. Gunson suggested that this would be very unhelpful to DH, and he hoped that Dr. Mortimer, who is a member of ACVSB, would be sensible. Um, first of all, who was PD? PD was Procurement Division, which I think later on became MDD, um, Medical Dir Devices Directorate. So basically, they were the people who had responsibility for screening tests. Now, I know you're reporting what Dr. Gunson said to you here, um, but um, wh why would a recommendation from PHLS uh, that um, this was a... a, a um, useful test be unhelpful to the Department of Health? Well, this is Dr. Gunson saying this. Now, one has to remember that Dr. Gunson was actually head of the transfusion service in England and Wales. And so um, he might well have been, when he talks about being unhelpful to DH, he might also have meant unhelpful to the transfusion service as well. And I think one of the questions here was that would a report from PHLS on a test which was really only just appearing, dep it depends really obviously what PHLS said, really. If PHLS said, look, we've done this test, and we've looked at, and I don't know which patients they were looking at. Were they looking at patients who had documented non-A, non-B uh, non transmission? Were they looking at, a, I don't know. You see, it really depends exactly what PHLS were going to say. Here, I'm just reporting 
that Dr. Gunson said that anything coming from PHLS which could be misconstrued or which could lead people to think, oh, well, the blood transfusion service is going to, is going to use this test you know, pretty quickly might have been unhelpful generally. And so I suspect that um, what he's saying there, Dr. Mortimer, who was on the ACVSB, and obviously he was aware of the discussions that were going on in ACVSB, he was actually in PHLS, and I'm not sure, um, uh, and presumably the work was being done within his bit of PHLS. He presumably would have actually taken that on board and may well not have actually needed any reminder of that. One reading might be that the Department of Health, um, in, in Dr. Gunson's view at least, um, uh, wasn't keen on introducing testing at this point in time. Well, I think the point is, uh, sorry, what's the date of this? Is May 89? This or is August, August 89. August 89, so it's just after the May meeting. July what? meeting. July meeting. And basically, at that meeting, it was decided not to go ahead with Chiron testing yet. And so that was basically the decision of the experts. And I think Dr. Gunson might well have there said that if PHLS starts saying something, which will muddy the waters, and you see it also would depend upon who the authors of the PHLS um, um, report were, because if you had Dr. Mortimer as one of the authors, then people would start saying, ah, oh, but he's a member of ACVSB, because I don't think the membership of ACVSB was secret. I think that was well known. So people might then start jump to conclusions and say, look, Dr. Mortimer, who's one of the members of ACVSB, has said, you know, it's party to this report, and it really depends exactly what the report said. So, as I say, I think it was, there's no suggestion there either that Dr. Gunson knew what the report was going to say, because it just says there that um, procurement directorate, who obviously had, um, who were responsible for screening tests, they had heard that PHLS were to publish results. Now, it's a case of what those results were, you know, exactly which patients or which people they'd been looking at or which donors they'd been looking at, and precisely what they said as a result of their tests. Uh, the, the well, th th this is your minute, Dr. Raymond, yes. and um, your your saying two things about the, the procurement directorates here. First of all, they've told you that they're um, going to be, uh, PHLS are going to be publishing results. Now, that can't be what Dr. Gunson thought was unhelpful, the mere publication of results, No, can no, it? I suspect, I mean, say, reading between the lines, well, not even reading between the lines, but my assumption, as I say, I cannot remember this minute, but my re assumption, reading this minute, and recollecting what I can of the individuals concerned is that Dr. Gunson was worried about what else would be there. If PHLS had literally just published the results and said, we tested, and again, it's not clear from there whether they're testing samples from patients who had been identified as having had non A, non B hepatitis, or is it a screen, whatever, don't know. It doesn't say there what it was going to be about. But Dr. Gunson's anxiety might have been that if in addition to publishing the results, the commentary about the results, and particularly if there were any recommendations with the results, that I presume was his concern. Okay. So you, you don't, do you agree with what was being said by Dr. Gunson, or did you agree with what was being said by Dr. Gunson, that a recommendation for use of the test would be very unhelpful to the Department of Health? I'm not, in that minute, I don't think I actually say anything. You don't, that's why I'm, I'm asking. I'm reporting, and I think that is what I'm doing. I'm reporting. And you see, because I'm reporting, and I'm reporting it to Dr. Jones, suggests that he was probably Dr. Pickle's line manager because obviously I've side copied Dr. Pickles, but because I have think that what I'm writing there is of significant importance, I'm writing it to him, and I think it was probably, 
I'm not sure whether Dr. Metis had yet taken over or not at this time, because if, if Dr. Metis had taken over, I would have assumed that I would have written to Dr. Metis. Because, and I think the thing is that because my contacts with Dr. Harris were much less than I, they were with, Mr. with Dr. Metis, because normally this sort of thing I would have written to Dr. Metis. My understanding is Dr. Harris retired on the, at the end of July of 1989. He chaired the 3rd of July 89 meeting, but Dr. Metis attended as an observer. Uh, and therefore, yeah, Dr. Right. Metis took over. The chairman. Yeah. Dr. Metis took over with effect from the beginning of August 1989. Yes. So I think this was probably uh, um, at the time. Uh, Otherwise, I would have written to Dr. Metis. Uh, in any event, just for the sake of completeness, we can pick up um, what Dr. Mortimer said to you a couple of months later in October 89 at DHSC 0003557 underscore 041. We can see um, it's, it's a letter of the 17th of October. We can see in the first paragraph it's a response to a request uh, for information from Dr. Metters. Um, we can skip over the first half of the letter, which was about HTLV1. The penultimate paragraph um, deals with hepatitis C testing. Dr. Metters' view there, the case for screening is very strong. And as soon as FDA approves screening by the ortho test and or Abbott test in USA, I think we should endeavour to screen universally here. If we do not act fairly quickly and cases of post-transfusion hepatitis attributable to HCV arise, I think we shall be in a weak position. Now, we'll look obviously at what the ACVSB subsequently um, did and didn't recommend. Um, but did, did that piece of information, um, would you expect that to have triggered a, a discussion within the department at least? about what was being said there in fairly strong terms. Well, I think the thing is, obviously, this was addressed to me, was it, this letter? Yes, it is. Right, OK, then I presume I would have actually passed it on to Dr. Metters, because obviously, you know, he needs to know. And I think the thing is, you see, this is still early days, and this was at the time when people were still not fully aware of the problems with specificity and sensitivity of these tests and to a large extent the tests obviously were being pushed by the manufacturers who were obviously interested in sales and they were obviously contacting anybody and everybody and presumably um, Dr. Mortimer used these tests and presumably on the basis of these tests he said all he can say is that he found I, as I say, again, it doesn't tell you who the tests were about. You know, and I think this is the difficulty with a lot of these things. You have to actually say, we tested patients who had non-A, non-B hepatitis, and a proportion of them, or however many of them, came up positive for hepatitis C, right? So then you know what you're talking about. If, on the other hand, you're looking at people where there is a low incidence of hepatitis C, such as the general population in the UK, then you might have a very different answer. So I think, you know, you've really got to look at that. And in a sense, you see, Dr. Mortimer is saying, look, from his experience, the test seems to be useful or helpful or whatever, and he thinks that with the FDA approval, that would be a major deciding factor. Now, the question then, in fact, obviously, is how good is the FDA? Because I think if you look later on in the papers, it says actually that the FDA were not recommending either supplementary or confirmatory testing for a very long time. And people might well then question how good were the FDA. Now, obviously, one shouldn't criticize them. But on the other hand, did they actually take on board everything that was going on? Or were they actually limiting themselves to a specific test and saying, this test looks as though it works? If, if we just then, before we move to the next set of minutes, um, look at the chairman's brief in advance of the next meeting, which was, which was due for the 6th of November 1989. It's DHSC 0002495 064. 
Uh, and if we go to the next page, we've got the heading non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, there's reference to um, a suggestion of, of there being reports from Dr. Gunson um, about, um, amongst other things, the Rome meeting that had taken place in, in the autumn of that year. Um, uh, and then, uh, third paragraph, the main issue for the committee is whether the time is right to make a decision about adopting the Chiron test. Dr. Gunson um, has suggested that the next step would be a field study, and there's a reference to approaching the department for, for, for £25,000 um, to purchase tests for, for a field study. Um, uh, uh, would this then have been something that at the, the uh, briefing meeting that, that you and Mr. Canavan would have attended uh, with Dr. Metters by now, um, w did those meetings, which I don't think we have any record of, I don't think they were minuted as such, would, would there be a discussion about the pros and cons of what might be suggested, or would you simply be identifying for Dr. Metters the decisions that the committee needed to consider? I don't think that Dr. Can uh, Mr. Canavan and I would actually put forward pros and cons, because in a sense, it's not us that is making the decision. It, because what we're saying to Dr. Well, in a sense, you see, we're continuing, as I said, our function was providing papers to the committee. This briefing is actually highlighting to Dr. Metters, you know, during this meeting, decisions ideally should be made, or at least sort of some semblance of the way forward should be considered. And I think, you know, Dr. Metters was very busy. You know, blood transfusion, it's not, a, not, not, not like me, where haematology was my life work. For him, haematology was one of a number of different committees, the ACVSB, I'm sure there were other committees he was chairing. So we are basically saying to him, look, <laughs> there's a committee meeting today that you've got in your diary, so you know you're going to it. This is what is likely to be discussed, and these are the things that you might want to raise with the committee. So in a sense, it's an aid memoir for him, because obviously he's so busy. I mean, say, the next day he may have something completely different. And, you know, we're obviously focused on this, so we provide him with an aid memoir, look, Committees happening today, these are the things you need to consider asking them. Ultimately, he decides what he wants to do. He's the chairman. We are prompting him. The prompts here don't include any reference to Dr Mortimer's views. Now, I appreciate entirely Dr Mortimer would be in, in attendance at the meeting, but the same would be true of Dr Gunson, of course. Um, uh, are you able to uh, assist in understanding why the, the, the fairly strong terms in which Dr. Mortimer had expressed himself in that in that letter to you um, are not picked up in the in the briefing? Well, I suspect. I mean, say this was in November. When was the previous meeting? In May. July. July. So a four-month so gap. Four-month gap. Right, in the four months, I suspect we may well have had a number of letters about Chiron, you know, either from Dr. Mortimer, other people on the ACVSB may have written to us. I'm pretty sure we would, I mean, say, the commercial companies were very much knocking on our doors, and particularly when it came to procurement directorate, they were forever chasing them, and they were chasing me. I remember going to meetings where they happened to be there, and they were forever saying to me, when are we going to introduce screening? Because obviously they were interested from a commercial point of view. Now, okay, sorry, I shouldn't say that, because that suggests they're not interested in the safety. Obviously they were interested in the safety, but they're other interest was to sell their product. So therefore they were chasing us. So therefore I suspect that a number of communications relating to non-A, non-B during those four months would have been quite considerable. And to actually identify each of them and to give them a sort of priority list saying, because this letter has come from Dr. Mortimer, who's a member of ACVSB, we ought to take this as being important. Whereas because this has come 
from a company, we can ignore it, or because it's come from another member of the ACVSB who is not a virologist, we can ignore it. So I suspect that this is very brief, and what we would highlight there is either if Dr. Mortimer had said he was going to be presenting his letter, and I think there was an occasion when Dr. Lane sent me a letter, and then we mentioned it in the briefing that his letter and that he was going to discuss it at the meeting, then obviously it would have appeared in that briefing. But Dr. Mortimer's letter was yet another letter, in a sense, of a whole string of letters. Can, can we go then to the 6th of November 1989 meeting, which is the fourth meeting, NHBT 00050043? Um, and if we go to page four, please, we've got the discussion on non-A, non-B hepatitis. I'm not going to go through all of it, but we see Dr. Gunston presenting uh, or speaking to his paper in paragraph 23. Um, paragraph 24 refers to some concerns being expressed about the test not appearing to be suitable for testing UK pooled plasma. Um, 25 is Dr. Tedder, uh, and then uh, 26 is what I wanted to ask you about first of all. Dr. Metters explained that although the department must bear in mind the possible litigation that could arise from a prolonged delay in the introduction of general screening, the NHS management executive would want to know more facts and figures before backing such a move. Now, we know from what you've already told us and from what others have told us, the ACVSB would produce a recommendation. Yes. And the... Um, the understanding appears to be it would ultimately be for the minister yes. to take a decision, and in due, in due course we see that in, I think, uh, um, uh, early 1991. Um, what was the role, insofar as you understood it, in that decision-making process of the NHS management executive? I suspect that what the reference there is, is that if one's making a recommendation to minister, then basically the non-management executive part of the department, because after all, management executive was part of the department. It was just a different bit. So you had the sort of policy side, so to speak, and the NHS management executive, which were the function side, to sort of make it very simple. So I suspect that the NHS management executive would need to know, you know, how is this going to impact on um, the workings of the NHS, i.e. introducing screening in blood transfusion service. Obviously, there were going to be costs of that, but not only costs, but actually the time take, uh, the, you know, personnel required and everything else. So there would be an effect on the NHS generally over and above the public health benefits to recipients. If we, we go back to the full page, then we can see bottom of the page then refers to some uh, figures about how many patients might be going on to develop chronic hepatitis. Dr. Gunson suggesting one in 200, others saying it might be higher. Um, top of the next page, paragraph 28. The feeling of the committee, as summed up by the chairman, was that the test represented a major step forward but that the committee need to know a great deal more about it and acknowledge the need for a confirmatory test. It was agreed that while the UK would not want to go on in advance of an FDA decision, it could prove difficult if the FDA do not decide in favour of the test. Nevertheless, it was felt that if the UK do put the test into general use, RTCs will need to have had experience with it, and therefore pilot studies should go on in Birmingham, Sheffield and Brentwood to show the feasibility of adding this test to routine practice. Um, and then the next paragraph, uh, committee's feeling there was no case for using surrogate tests. ACVSB would support the general introduction of the Chiron test if the FDA approves it and the pilot shows it to be feasible and non-problematic. Now, just pausing there, it is, is it right to understand these minutes as, as essentially showing well, that there were three conditions or, or further matters that needed to take place before the ACVSB would reach a, a, a view. Uh, that was confirmatory test, 
FDA approval and pilot studies. Is that how you understood it? That's what it would appear, yes. Okay. And then paragraph 29 continues, for these reasons it was felt that the committee should be developing an economic case I percentage of non-A, non-B that would be prevented in any other data to support it for the department to fund the routine use of the test. Now, first of all, in relation to that, um, why was the committee getting involved in questions of funding? I don't think they're asking the committee to... Well, OK, they say the committee should be developing it, but in the end... The economic case was not considered by the committee at all. That was considered in-house by DH. We were the ones that did the um, uh, um, cost-benefit analysis and everything, and the committee wasn't asked to do that. I think, in essence, what they're seeking here is that because the committee had the experts who could provide some of the background for the cost-benefit analysis that the department would then do. So I think it's here not saying that the committee in its totality would be involved. It was just that individual committee members might be able to contribute to help us develop the uh, cost-benefit analysis. Now, I, I don't, don't want to take time up going through all the documentation relating to the cost-benefit analysis yes. that the, there's quite a lot of material, and, yes. and, and it probably isn't all yes. of it, in the material that you've seen. You, you certainly produced a version of it. I think others commented on it. Yes. Um, uh, uh, um, um, and it was considered by, I think, a number of different branches and teams within the department at various stages. In, in terms of ultimate funding, is it correct that the department didn't, in fact, stump up the funding for the test as things turned out? regional health authorities were required to fund it from their existing resources? Yes, I th you know, I'd have to look at the, every single detail of that, but I mean, say, read the, looking at it generally, overall, it would appear that the regional health authorities were advised that this was to be considered an additional cost that they would have to increase in their use of funding and that um, they would have to decide what other... Um, expenditure would have to make way for this, at least temporarily, until the next... See, because I think a lot of this is a case of funding rounds from one year to the next, because obviously in the year in which the test was introduced, then they might well be asked <laughs> to find the funds for it in that year, but obviously for the following year, they could then make a bid to the department saying, look, we've got this as an extra pressure, so you need to pay us that bit more. Now, you were involved, as I've said, in putting together the economic case, the cost-benefit analysis. As far as you can recall, did you have any involvement in the department's decision not to provide funding, or, de or decision oh, no, whether that or not would to be completely funding? outside my role. I th sorry, I could sort of point out that with the cost-benefit analysis, this is something that is recommended internationally, and I think I've referred to two particular documents where they say that prior to introducing a screening test for blood to prevent transmission of infections, a cost-benefit analysis should be undertaken. Um, now, that meeting was 6th of November 1989. Um, According to the Penrose report, I, I, we haven't provided you with this, but um, I, I hope you'll take it from me. Um, the, the Chiron test was approved for export, not, not yet FDA licensed, but approved for export on the 27th of November 1989. Um, uh, do you know whether that came to your attention or Mr. Canavan's attention at the time, or, or, or was the subject of discussion within the department? I haven't got any particular documents I can prompt you with, I'm afraid. No, I, I can't the, really the, say. I mean, say the people that would have... Sorry. The people that would have known about it would obviously be procurement division. I think they still were procurement division at that stage because obviously they were the people that were involved. One of their functions was um, screening tests and obviously they were the ones that were in direct contact with the companies and they would know everything that was going on there. So in the Penrose report, it's paragraph... 31.154, uh, the, the, There's a reference to the, the source of it. It's uh, a letter from Ortho. Uh, it's at NHBT 
40188 underscore 123. Thank you, sir. And, and it's a letter to cash from Ortho to say that an exporter license had been granted. And apparently the FDA told Gunston, I think that's what comes from the, uh, the A and uh, others litigation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I note the time, and we, we've, we've got through four of the nine meetings I need to ask Dr. Raymond to look at with me, but I think perhaps we should break for lunch now. Yes. Uh, well, we'll take a break until two o'clock. So two o'clock. <laughs>